Hello and welcome back to the Irish Tennis Updates podcast. My name is Adam, your host. This week I chat to Grania O'Neill. Grania grew up playing tennis in Nace. She was a, a top junior. Uh, she won she, she won the triple in fits, under 18, singles, doubles and mixed. From there she went to college in Ohio State in, in the US. And since then she's begun working with Tennis Ireland as the national coordinator for the Women in Tennis programme. Uh, so in that role, she she promotes women in tennis. So we talk about her junior days, we talk about her time in college, and we also get into to what what it is she's doing with 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 Tennis Ireland at the moment and her her plans and hopes with with that role. And we also talk about her experience playing interpros last year and how she sees interpros in the context of of Irish tennis. I think this is a a brilliant um, chat. I, I learned a lot on. On that, and also, um, really great to talk to to Gronia about her her experiences in tennis. So I hope that you you enjoy this and you find it interesting and you take something from it. So without further ado, let's get into it. And I'll begin by asking Gronia what superpower she would choose. I if I have to choose my superpower would probably be teleportation. Um, yeah. It's not a very glamorous answer, but um, I suppose you know, the ability to get from A to B as quickly as possible. That'd be really nice. So I think that'd be my superpower. Absolutely. I think I, I agree with you on that one. I think it's a, it definitely come in handy. Solid um, choice. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, now, yeah, just to look at, get into kind of your, your tennis story, just to go back to the start, like how do you look back on, on your early days playing tennis in Nice and, and growing up there? Uh, yeah, I have really fond memories um, of Nice. Obviously I'm still playing there today. Um, I'm thinking back, I guess, my early days, I suppose NACE really had a much smaller junior structure, um, you know, than the kind of powerhouse I suppose it is today. Um, So I kind of would have hit with a core group of lads in NACE growing up. Um, It was my brother, Finian, I had Jack Hughes, Derek Lavin, Rory White, Adam O'Connell. So I kind of was really lucky that they... They were probably a few years older than me, so they kind of pushed me on and, and made me progress in my game. And I think that, along with, I had really, really fantastic coaches throughout my junior career. So um, I would have been introduced to tennis with uh, John Brady. Um, he was a coach okay. in Nace at the time, and he just, he still coaches actually to this day, and he's such a nice guy. But his big premise with tennis and with coaching kids was just to make it really enjoyable. Um, so I think. I kind of the love of the game was developed really early on and I you know I never felt like I was you know it felt like a chore or anything it was always so enjoyable and fun so I think that was really important um and also two other coaches as well who were fantastic John and Coulson um was another one who kind of came on the latter end of my um junior career and he really yeah. focused on my technical side um changed my forehand completely which really really helped and then I also had uh, Mark Carpenter he was a really good player as well and um, kind of would have, looked, would have looked up to him as a player, but then ended up getting coached by him as well. And, and, and he was fantastic. So, yeah, like I, I, I look back, like I obviously worked really, really hard, um, but I think I really enjoyed myself first and foremost um, on the court. And I think that's that's probably one of the reasons I still play today. Um, you know, I, I really do enjoy it, whether it be DLTC League, Opens, you know, club competitions. I really enjoy still being on the court. So. Uh, you know, Nace has, I suppose Nace has given me so much, um, tennis has given me so much, but Nace was definitely kind of the starting block for that, so. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think those points you make on on just enjoying it and that being, you know, fun being the centre, I think, especially early on, but, you know, all the way through, I think it, it is just massive and keeping people in the game and getting people in the game, it's 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 just, it's so big, I think, that an enjoyment factor. Yeah, it's tough. Like, it's, it's obviously, it's an injury sport, so... I think the more we can kind of um, implement team aspect and like the team side of things, whether it be doubles, whether it be, you know, team events, I think I, I find from my career, the most enjoyment I've got is when I'm involved in teams. So yeah. I, I do think that's the way forward. And, and that whole idea of maybe, you know, you have your formal competition for the high level, but you also have that idea of the informal competition. So you're kind of giving everyone a chance to play and there's not so much pressure because, you know, it is difficult and probably locked down a show that there's so few tournaments in Ireland. So you kind of have to be at the best year, best year ability. Yeah. Um, and I think competitions has improved so much in the last years. I think that's down to James as well. A lot, a lot with what he's done, but um, yeah, like I think definitely just keeping it fun and enjoyable. And that, that's really the reason why 
you know, you see girls and guys continuing to play on today. They 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 enjoy it first and foremost. So. Yeah, no, and on that, just the competition and the more casual competition, like even in Greystones, the last couple of weeks, we've got going uh, box leagues, you know, in groups, and you play them and you move up and down, you know, to, to make it competitive, yeah. but, but casual at the same time. And I think that's a really good, really good thing to bring in and that just adds a lot to you know, all, all levels as well, you know. Absolutely, yeah. No, I think it's a no-brainer and um, just it, it gives a bit of a buzz around clubs as well, I think. Um, yeah. You know, if you have that that whole idea. And we, in NACE, we try and kind of do practice sessions with all levels um, when in the lead up to league and, and in between as well. I, I do think it, it, it kind of creates a nice atmosphere in clubs. So I, I definitely would be a big advocate for that. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. that's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, you mentioned there are a couple of people, but did you have any kind of role models you would have looked up to growing up? Yeah, um, I think really when I think about that, probably my mum, she would have started playing tennis. She actually only picked up a racket in her early 20s. Um, so she was working in Luxembourg and she was there with my dad at the time. I was actually born there um, and she would have only picked up a racket in her 20s and really took to it. And that actually when they moved back home, um, she would have joined NACE, was obviously the first club, <laughs> first and only club. <laughs> She's actually a member in Wexford now, but yeah. um, she would have joined NACE straight away and kind of really talked to it. And like a lot of her friends and friendships have been made in the club. And but yeah, I think I would have looked up to her. She actually ended up, she won the club championship twice in NACE. Um, so she well. ended up, she, you know, she obviously progressed through and yeah. high level. And um, but yeah, it was so nice to play with her and then just kind of obviously that that whole mother daughter relationship. but um, yeah, I definitely would have looked up to her growing up. She was she was a fantastic role model. Yeah, she no, is. as yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, as as you then grew up and you were, you know, obviously playing with your mom and playing, you know, different people your age and, and the coaching and keeping all that up. Like how how often did you train and how kind of big a part of your life was was that for you? Hmm, yeah, I trained I tra- I would have trained a lot. Um I think growing up I would have played a lot of sports um, mm. and I think that's really important for kids um, just play as many sports as you see or as many sports as you can see what you like uh, so I would have played loads of sports growing up and would have tennis would have been at the would have always been at the in the background but um, you know kind of 10s 12s 14s I would have been involved in maybe Leinster squads uh, you know doing some hitting in ace obviously some practice matches so I would have probably played about two, three times a week. And then once I hit kind of 14, 16s, mm. um, I would have obviously played a lot more. And then I think transition year was kind of the the big leap for me in terms of I took transition year to as the opportunity to play as much tennis as I could. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I really did enjoy it. Like I, I kind of look back now and it seems a bit mad how much I did. Yeah. Um, but at the time I, I didn't think any different and you know I was really enthusiastic about it. Um, I think I was really lucky as well. I had really supportive parents so they kind of gave me the opportunity to t- take me to whatever training I needed to go to. Um, and, and I suppose they would have pushed me but they always put it on me to decide what I wanted to do. So yeah. kind of you know the start of the year was that sit down at the dinner table. Okay, Grania, what do you want to do? Yeah. <laughs> what can you feasibly do? What would you like to do? Um, I think that's really important for parents to have that relationship that, you know, they're supporting you, but also they're taking into consideration what you want um, and, and making sure that you're motivated yourself because there's no point playing tennis, uh, you know, as a kid, if you, if you don't enjoy it, you know, yeah. <laughs> like you're not going to get anything out of it. You're not going to continue playing. So absolutely um yeah so as you then you know move towards the end of your junior days i know under 18s you in, in fits you you managed to do to do the triple and then you won all three so how how special is that to look back on for you that that that, that week or that weekend or yeah it was uh it was really special yeah it was really nice um i i have really nice memories looking back on it i i think the lead up to that um you know i'd sat down with my coaches mark and, and jonathan kind of probably back in April of that year, I'd, I'd made goals. Uh, I think yeah. that's really important. So I kind of sat down and we wrote out short-term goals, um, you know, like week by week, month by month. And then we kind of set obviously those long-term overreaching, what, what I'm hoping to do by the end of the year. Because I think and anyone who's played tennis in, in juniors will know, like Fitz obviously is the big one at the end of the year, but it is at the latter stage of the summer. Yeah. So... <laughs> It's difficult, you know, like if you're playing tournaments week in, week out, you, you might start to be a little bit tired, you know, run up some niggles, some injuries. Um, so I kind of wanted to 
hopefully not burn out, but also yeah, exactly not peak that. too early and start, you know, <laughs> winning winning tournaments when, you know, I, I'm hoping to win at the latter end of the year, so or latter end of the summer. So yeah, I would have played a mixture, a mixture of senior and junior opens really throughout the summer. And then yeah. um, obviously it kind of helped my my focus and my mindset to be like, okay, Fitz is the big one, that's the big goal. Um, but yeah, it was really special. Like I think probably what was so nice about it, um, the, the, that finals day, there would have been uh, Janine and Megan, they were in the girls' final doubles, I think under 14. Um, mm. And Dara, who was my kind of hitting partner throughout, uh, you know, my time in NACE, he was in the, the guys' double finals under 18. And then obviously I was in the, the singles final. So we had a, a big bus come down from NACE, okay. um, you know, down on the N7 and, and they came down and supported me. And I think I, I probably, <laughs> I joke about it now with Sinead, but like there was a huge amount of support for me and I think it was great. You know, I kind of felt like everyone was on my side and cheering me on. Um, so that was really, really nice. And um, yeah, like I think, you know, the singles obviously was kind of a personal goal that I had in mind and it was a, you know, personal achievement, but um, to kind of top it off, win the mixed and then the the doubles, the doubles went to a three setter okay. and to win, kind of, I, I ended up obviously winning with um, Alison Clark, who had been my doubles partner since we were under 12s. So wow. it was really, really special to kind of, you know, finish off our junior career by winning fits, obviously. So yeah, no, it was definitely, it was, it's a really lovely memory to look back on. Um, yeah. Definitely, I definitely, it was, it was so nice to have the support of the club. That was really special as well. You know, you mentioned there that you kind of had pressure on yourself. You know, this, this was the big one. And then all, you know, all the, the, the people up from, from NACE had traveled down. So do you, do you think, you know, did you feel pressure then that day that, from yourself and from the others? I did, yeah. I, uh, I think I bombed the first set. <laughs> I can't remember what the score was. <laughs> But I think I, I, I do remember, I think I lost like six love or six one in the first set. And I remember thinking, oh dear, like these people have traveled so yeah. far and I am not making a good account of myself. And I actually think I remember I, I, I went into the toilets and just kind of gathered my nerves and, and, and my thoughts yeah. and just said, look, just go out there and swing. Like don't think so much. Um, I had the tendency in, in, in my juniors to, to overthink um, and to overanalyze and, I'm quite an aggressive player, so a lot of the time, if I win or lose, it's probably on my racket. Yes, yeah. Um, if I'm if I'm making shots or if I'm not making shots, so I think definitely like just reassessing and calming down, and that helped a lot. But yeah, I think it's a tough one. Like juniors, you put so much pressure on yourself, um, and definitely if you just like, I think if I could have just been a bit calmer and maybe a bit more patient in in my my tennis my tennis matches I probably would have been a bit more successful but uh hey ho <laughs> in <laughs> hindsight's a great thing <laughs> yes yeah yeah so would you say then after that that week in fits well obviously it's kind of the end of your your junior days and obviously it ended in in the best possible way so did you almost feel you know how did that, did that, did that feel strange that you were done and you know almost kind of came off a a high and you know almost felt a bit lost or did you really kind of you know what you know you knew, you knew what to do when you pushed on like how, how was the aftermath of that for you yeah it, it it was a lovely feeling like I definitely I probably soaked it up as much as I yeah, could yeah. um yeah I think like with that you kind of have to look to what's next so the big thing for me was um I never really thought of going to the states on um, and playing tennis and it wasn't really until I won fit that I felt you know, I had the confidence to kind of go for it and, and start looking into colleges. So for me, it was, it was lovely. And like, I, it was, it's a great memory, but at the same time, when it happened, I was kind of like, okay, that's great. What's next? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how can I keep playing tennis? How can I keep enjoying it? Um, you know, for some people it might've been different. It might've been kind of the end of their tennis, mm. their competitive tennis days. But for me, I was kind of thinking, what, what could I do next? Yeah. And it was all in your, you, know, you took it in your stride kind of and, and, it, and yeah. looked forward. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so how, how so you, you obviously then you said you, you went on to, to uh, college in the States. So how was that decision firstly to go to, to the States? And then how easy was it then once you made that decision to, to go and, and, and choose a college? Yeah, it was, um, it was, yeah, it, it probably took some twists and turns actually selecting what college I ended up going to. So mm. um, when I started out looking um you know, I, I was fortunate. My coach at the time, Mark, he would have had, you know, he knew some of the lads who'd gone over there and he yeah. kind of got me in contact with them and allowed me to have, a, you know, sit down and have a chat one-on-one. -on -one. 
So that definitely did help. Um, but it, you know, there probably wasn't as much information out there as there is nowadays. Um, I ended up uh, doing a video. So I did a video okay. um, just in the tennis club, myself yeah. hitting, playing a few points. Um, ended up, you know, doing a CV and and just sending out emails to to college coaches. Um, I was in contact with the. I suppose a good few schools, but in the end, it ended up actually being a personal connection that got me over the line. So, um, Kira Fanukin, um, who I think actually Paul Casey might have mentioned in one of uh, your podcasts. Yes. She, yeah, yeah, she yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. So she actually went to Ohio State, um, and she ended up kind of. I, I got in contact with her, and, and she was fantastic. She said, "Look, Ohio State." She spoke really highly of the program. She said it was fantastic, and she just said the experience was amazing, and she'd recommend it to anyone um and she actually ended up reaching out to the coach there and, and and saying asking asking him to look at my video and kind of take a look at my results and yeah so from there i would have you know i was chatting to the coach at the time who was chuck mersbacker um and ended up going on a recruiting visit over there completely overwhelmed with the whole occasion like i i didn't <laughs> i had an idea of what college was in america but it was i kind of went there on one of the looking back now I realized it was probably one of the bigger kind of football games to go over mm. and it was an amazing recruiting trip okay. um, but I remember just being so overwhelmed like it was my first time in America they were so like you know I was going we went to a football game and it was a hundred and ten thousand stadium wow um just you know there was tailgating and marching bands and it was it was it was amazing and I think I had a really I had a really nice experience um, and I think just meeting the girls they were lovely the team the girls who were going to be on you know potentially my teammates they were so nice the coaches were lovely the setup like the facilities were incredible um, so to be honest after the recruiting trip I was pretty much sold um, yeah now he kind of did actually have to see me play because he was like <laughs> I've obviously seen you on video but I'd really like to see you play in person yeah. um, so he actually so I would have went on the recruiting trip October of midterm break, um, I think in fifth year, and then or was it sixth year? Gosh, I can't even remember now. But that Christmas, he ended up coming over to the national indoors to watch me play. Okay. Um. So so obviously, I actually I don't think I played that well. <laughs> I wasn't happy. Ended up losing. I played actually Tanya, um, who my who I played doubles with now. Um, I ended up losing that match. Didn't really feel great about how I played, but. He obviously liked he liked yeah. something um, and he offered me a scholarship there. Um, so, yeah, so I think nowadays there's I mean, there's so many resources and there's so many more people who've gone over, like even the likes of Mark Finnegan with mm, all sports yeah. recruitment. Like, I think that's amazing. Like, I would have loved that too, you know, back when I was starting yeah. out because I was a little bit in the dark and it was kind of just through reaching out to people who I knew and people that my coach knew or anyone else knew um so I think definitely the process is it, it's exciting and I, I'm I'm just such a big advocate for it like anyone any girls or guys who come up to me and ask me and kind of inquire about how my time was there I'm I'm always just like try as much as you can to go and you know at the end of the day if you don't enjoy it you can always come home <laughs> you yeah, know you yeah, defer yeah, your CEO yeah. you can always come home if you need to um but yeah it was it was it was brilliant yeah just an amazing experience yeah, no, I must say you're, the the coach you had is a, a brilliant name, Chuck Chuck Mer, Mersbanger. But yeah. but, <laughs> uh, but um, it sounds like before you went to the college, you had a, a you know you would you've been over, you'd had a look, and you'd spoken to Kira who who had told you about it. So you had a pretty good idea of of what it was going to be like. So how did your your four years there compare to your, your expectations? Um, yeah, I think I had I had an idea, um, but I I probably didn't know. Uh, expectations wise I didn't realize probably how competitive the tennis would be okay. um I think that was that was a, a big shock um when I went over there just the standard is so good um I remember actually remember my freshman year um I would have played I think it was five or six in the lineup to start and uh, I think it was one of my first conference matches I played a girl from University of Iowa I still remember to this day <laughs> And I think she served the first game. And so I was serving the second game, a little bit tight, a little bit nervous. Yeah. I threw in a double fault and she looked me down in the eye, <laughs> did a fist pump and yelled, come on. And I said, all right, okay, <laughs> this is how they do it in America. Um, so I think, you know, it is, it's a lot, obviously a lot more loud, noisy, 
a lot more energy, you know, during matches. I, I would have been used a junior competition where, you know, if you yelled, you know, people would frown or like, you know, yeah. <laughs> frown yeah. upon what you were doing. Um, and then, you know, the likes of going to college and uh, being frowned upon if you weren't yelling or if you yeah. weren't kind of being encouraging and, uh, and everything like that. So it definitely, I think that side of it was a little bit of a shock to me, but you know, I, I think it was great as well because it was so competitive and I had, you know, some really, really good matches. Um, but yeah, I think that was probably, that was probably the, a bit of a shock. But um, I think in general, the expectation why I probably didn't realize how big the support structure is over there. Okay. Um, so I had an idea, obviously, there was going to be a coach and, you know, you had a team, you, know, you had teammates who were all looking out for you. Um, but I think I just didn't realize how big, the athletics is over there you know like I went over there and it was uh Chuck unfortunately actually left just the summer before I came in so I had uh, a, a new uh, head coach Melissa uh, <laughs> Melissa yeah. Shaw probably yeah. doesn't have a, a <laughs> glamorous name as Chuck um but you know I would have had Melissa who was head coach who would have had a vol uh, an assistant coach a volunteer assistant coach physio trainer a fitness trainer we had an academic advisor we had an athletic director who oversaw our program we had uh, the men's tennis coach who ended up being the director of tennis. So he looked after and oversaw both of our programs. So, you know, they kind of, they really went, and then obviously your professors as well. So they really went above and beyond to look after you there. Um, I think that that side of it was just incredible. Um, and I think just for me as well, the alumni, the community, um, I think, you know, obviously Ohio State is one of the larger schools over there. So so I think someone said to me recently, the alumni might be about 4 million. Okay. So just a huge, huge alumni. Yeah. So huge. I mean, it was really fun because you'd, you'd go through airports and the big thing at Ohio State is when you, you yell OH and then someone says IO back. Okay. Um, so, you know, we'd be going through uh, Dallas airport. I don't even know if there's an airport in Dallas, but, you know, any of these in airports to go and travel and people would obviously see our, our college gear and, you know, they'd be walking past us going, oh, wait. And then we all have to go, I owe back. <laughs> so, and it's actually happened to me. Um, I was walking through Smithfield Square one day with one of my friends and I got, I had a high state hat on and a guy yelled just in passing, like, oh, wait. And I said, oh, I owe. Almost like a natural, <laughs> natural yeah. instinct. Yeah. And I absolutely freaked my friend out. He was like, sorry, what just happened there? <laughs> I had to kind of explain, no, that, that was what we did, you know, when I was at Ohio State. Um, so I think just the community atmosphere there was incredible. And I, I was really lucky. My teammates were amazing. I, I kind of made friends for life. Um, they actually came over for my 21st birthday and surprised me to Ireland. Um, so like just really incredible girls. So I, I, I think I kind of struck gold and got lucky with that. Yeah, so. brilliant. Do you have a best memory on you know on the court or 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 off the court? Oh my goodness! Um, probably yeah, on the court, a, a huge team memory would have been. Um, so when I would have came to Ohio State, we would have probably been in the fifties or sixties ranking wise, um, and we obviously progressed through um, and got higher up in the rankings. But I think the one of the best team memories. And it actually wasn't a huge upset, but at the time we would have been ranked, it was my second year there, so I was a sophomore. At the time we would have been ranked, I think, maybe in the 40s. And yeah. we ended up beating University of Tennessee, who were probably ranked top 20 at the time, which is obviously a huge jump. Um, yeah. And I just remember it was a really close, it was a close dual match, and I think it was a 4-3 win. And I just remember the absolute excitement we had in the team room after, um, like we were all jumping around dancing and then like our coach came in and was dancing with us. And I think that kind of gave us the push that, okay, we're actually, you know, as a team, we're good enough to compete with the best of the best. Yeah. Um, so that was a, just an amazing experience and something we always look back on. Um, you know, there was another, we had one other team, um, you know, we played, Another, another great memory for us as well, we played national indoors my senior year. Now, I, I didn't actually play in the lineup my senior year, but it would have been, um, I think it was the quarterfinals of the national indoors, and we ended up playing Vanderbilt, who were ranked number one at the time. Okay. And it came down to very last match, you know, 
extremely dramatic. Everyone in the, it was an indoor facility, so everyone kind of crowded around the match. And Miho, who um, is a really good friend of mine, she ended up clinching for us. Oh, and yeah. we all kind of ran out to the court and hugged her. And I think that was incredible memory as well, just because it, it was just an absolute nail biter. Um, you know, down to the last match, she came from behind to, to clinch it. So, and then obviously the fact that they were the number one team in the, in the country at the time, yeah. it was a really nice memory. Um, but yeah, those probably were my best team memories. And um, personally, I think I, I had a, I suppose, you know, tennis wise, I was really happy in my junior year, how, you know, I kind of had to uh, jump in at the, the latter end of the lineup in singles. Um, for anyone who probably has played lower in the lineup, you'll know, you know, if you are in a strong enough team, you're almost expected to win every match. Um, yeah. You know, you have to get that singles point. Um, and I wasn't actually playing doubles at the time. So with college tennis, you know, you play your doubles first and then you go out and do the singles lineup. So um, I would have kind of, you know, my coach put a lot of faith and trust in me to always kind of get that singles point lower in the lineup. So um, I, I think my junior year, I was really happy how I played. And, you know, I only think I lost maybe two or three times during the conference. So I was really happy with that and, and just kind of how we competed and everything like that. But um, yeah, I think those are the best memories. I think it's funny though, like I'm, I'm saying tennis memories now, but like a lot of the, a lot of the memories that I look back on are like silly, you know, silly trips where we got stuck in airports or, you know, we missed flights or yeah. we got up at the wrong time. And, you know, uh, you know, just funny moments and a lot of, you know, you spend so much time with these group of girls, you just, you're, you're sick of each other sometime but you also have a lot of a lot of fun kind of uh, fun silly occasions that you can look back on and just I think probably time spent with the girls during season were probably some of my best memories as well yeah so I guess it's combining the two the tennis and and the personal very much as well the, 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 it's the two aspects you would have taken away from it absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. Um, no definitely um, yeah, so just as you finish up college, what, what, what's your plans then? You leave college. How do you look with tennis or how do you move on? Yeah, so it, it, it was a weird one. Um, so I would have finished playing in 2016, but I still had to finish my degree. So okay. I actually ended up staying on the team and being a volunteer assistant coach for a year and then graduating in 2017. So um, my degree would have been it was a Bachelor of Science in Sports Industry, which probably would be the equivalent of like a sports management degree here in Ireland. Yeah, okay. um, so it, it was probably quite a specific or like a niche area um, that I, I, I struggled. I'll be honest with you, I did struggle a bit when I came home because I was trying to find work. And there wasn't a huge amount on offer in, in terms of the sports sector. Um, so I actually ended up um, you know, working working in Super Value, my local Super Value in Blessington, where my parents yeah. were living at the time, and I was doing the eight to four shift, and then I was I kind of actually fell into tennis coaching, um, you know, in the evening time because I had that bit more time, and I was, you know, going to the the tennis club in Nace and and doing some hits with with some of the juniors, and I think a lot of the experiences I had in college, um, you know, it wasn't so much the technical help that I was giving yes, them, it was yeah. more the tactical um and you know match scenarios and and how to approach certain games and how to approach certain players so I kind of reluctantly got into coaching but then I actually realized how much I actually enjoyed it as well yeah, yeah. um and, and and how how much I probably absorb absorbed through you know my junior career along with going to the states and, and playing in the team and, and you know getting great coaching so um yeah, I would have would have done kind of coaching through that. And I, I still actually do part-time coaching in Nace as well. Um, so I, I, yeah, I suppose it was a different, different setup when I came home initially. And then I, yeah. I, got, I then I got actually James Kuski, who was working for a recruitment agency at the time, set me up with a job um, in a sports photography firm, which was great as well. Yeah. So I would have had quite, you know, I would have only be knowledgeable in tennis and wouldn't know much about other sports whereas the you know working in the sports photography firm kind of opened my eyes up to all the other sports that Ireland has to offer um all this you know fantastic sports athletes that are out there yeah. um so so yeah so that was great yeah brilliant yeah um you know just to I know you, you now uh, work with with tennis Ireland so to move on to that a little bit was that did you always kind of as you went through those different jobs you mentioned did you always kind of hope to end up in a job like you have now was that always your kind of your goal yeah it's 
it's funny if someone had said to me coming out of college um what would your you know ideal job be it'd probably be the job spec that tennis parent tennis Ireland put up for <laughs> for my role now um I I definitely jumped jumped on it as soon as it came out um I think when I was at a higher state I would have um you know I would have had a lot of great female role models and mentors so yeah my head coach Melissa you know she was obviously highly regarded you know coach in in American colleges and you know brought a program that was ranked 60 to <laughs> number one and it's now a top 10 ranked college uh, yeah. team so like she was highly regarded and then you know I would have done an internship in the athletics department and my supervisor at the time was Janine Oman who was also one of the athletic directors um, at Ohio State um, and just probably to put it into context like the athletics department at Ohio State it was a building with 10 floors <laughs> um, <laughs> So a lot of employees yes, yeah. and she was, you know, she was obviously one of the top directors. So I think that experience kind of made me realize, oh, we don't really have as many women at the top of the, the sports industry in Ireland. Um, I kind of felt like, okay, this maybe needs to change or we should do something about that to, to look into it. So um, yeah, definitely. I, I would always have wanted this job. I think, um, you know, I'm honoured to obviously lead the women in tennis, but I'm kind of personally passionate about it anyway. I'd be a yeah. huge advocate yeah. for women's sport, regardless if it was my job or not. Um, so I kind of just feel really lucky that I have it um, and that I can kind of make a change. So, um, yeah, definitely jumped at it straight away. I was yeah. like, oh, where's my CV? I need to update and everything like that. So Yeah, no, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Just for anyone who doesn't know, what is your, your exact job title? So it, it, it's a long-winded one. <laughs> um, so I'm the national coordinator for the Women in Tennis program at Tennis Ireland. So I usually, that's a, it, it's a long, long title, but I usually just tell people I'm the Women in Sport Lead for Tennis. Yeah. So my, my role would have came about through Sport Ireland. Um, you know, so back in, I think it was about 2017, Sport Ireland conducted a huge amount of research on women's sport. Um, and they would have launched their women in sport policy in 2018. Um, I think 2018 was a fantastic year for women's sport. Um, but yeah, so they would have launched this policy and they kind of identified four different areas that they wanted to focus in on to improve the overall landscape of women's sport in Ireland. Um, I'll list out the four different areas now. Yeah. <laughs> so the four different areas, it was coaching and officiating was the first one. Um, active, active participation was the second one. Um, leadership and governance and then the last strand was visibility so they kind of felt okay if we focus in on these four different areas you know we can really make a difference um, and I think Sport Ireland by launching that policy really made it a priority you know to actually focus in on so so yeah so they provided funding obviously to any local sports partnerships any national governing bodies that wanted to implement this policy and so that's kind of really how my role came about. Um, you know, they wanted to employ specific personnel to actually look into this. Um, and they wanted, you know, they wanted NGBs to actually create, you know, women in sport positions. And I think it's really great, actually. So Sport Ireland have been great. They've offered a lot of, um, you know, opportunities for us to meet, even during lockdown, like over Zoom. Um, and someone said it to me recently, but I hadn't obviously even thought about it, but it's so nice that all of the women in sport leads are women, <laughs> you yes, know, so, yeah. you know, we're not kind of, it's all women and we're all kind of trying to do the same thing. But yeah, I think it's, it's, it's obviously, um, it's a, it's a great opportunity. I think just the fact I am very enthusiastic about it. Um, I probably <laughs> Or people <laughs> always talking about it, but I just think it's so nice to have a job that I, I I'm really you know passionate about. So absolutely, yeah. Now, now you mentioned those four um, pillars that, that Sport Ireland uh, came uh, came came out with. So when you started your your job, what, what kind of one or two big ambitions would you have had? And then on that as well, how do you think things have gone so far? Um, yeah. So I think just first and foremost, um, I think the whole idea of setting up action plans or strategies are the most important thing so you know it's great to have a conversation about women's sport but you probably need to actually set down goals so you can actually record progress um so ambitions wise yeah i think certainly um 
I really want to grow the program as much as possible. So I really kind of, I want to develop a support structure for women's tennis. Um, you know, right now, um, I think it's a great time for women's sport. Like I think there is a bit of a culture shift. Um, I think it is being viewed uh, and taken more seriously. The whole idea of even the 2020 campaign, I think that's yeah. an example. They really set out specific targets and, and gone after it. Um, my specific role itself, yeah, like when I started, so I would have started the role in February of this year. Um, so I think, obviously, ha haven't spent as much time in the office um, as, as, yeah. as many other colleagues. Um, but yeah, so w once lockdown, you know, I started in February. Um, my first, my first step was obviously conducting research. I think I was really lucky. Obviously, it was unfortunate that we went into a lockdown, but I think it was fortunate. I was fortunate then that people had time on their hands to, to do the survey. And I was really just trying to, you know, research people's attitudes um, towards women's tennis and what needs to be done. So I think that really kind of helped me develop, you know, a specific plan and, and kind of I revised the strategy that we initially had in place based off the reactions that we got and the feedback we got, which was fantastic. Um, but yeah, so since since lockdown, we've tried to develop more of a social media campaign surrounding women's tennis. So you might have seen it on the Tennis Ireland social media page, but we're trying to highlight our, our women leaders both on and off the tennis court. So you would have yeah. seen players, coaches, but also some administrators highlighted. So it's interesting, like when I started the role, I kind of came in being like, oh, I know everyone in tennis, you know, <laughs> I played a couple of tournaments. I know, I know a couple of people in clubs, you know, I, I know the whole tennis community. It's very small, but actually in reality, there's so few, there, you know, I only probably know about 5% of mm. the tennis community. Like there's so many that play, so many that coach. Um, so I think it's been really interesting to, and I really want to increase the vis visibility and to continue that. I think that's really important. Um, another thing, I suppose we, we've, where um, we've hosted some webinars. So the big thing in my role is I want to empower women to take up leadership positions, empower women and girls um, to take up leadership positions um, in tennis. So uh, a, a huge a huge factor that's been identified in, in women not taking up leadership positions is a lack of confidence. So yeah. one of the actions yeah. we're trying to do is, is upskill women and, and make women feel confident to kind of apply for leadership roles. Um, so we, we hosted a few webinars, um, which have got really good feedback. And I, I think I really want to continue doing webinars or events if obviously things return back yes, to normal. Yeah. Um, but I think that's really important as well. And um, we actually also have, uh, our strategy is actually going to be publicized. Um, and we're, that's going to be publicized, I think, very, very shortly. And then we also have a club charter coming out. So the club charter for us is a way to, for clubs to sign up to, um, they're endeavouring to kind of pick three, three different actions that they want to, to do to promote gender equality. Um, so it's kind of putting the onus on clubs to pick, pick what they want to do mm -hmm. specifically in their own club and, and, and you know, creating that actionable change. Um, but I'm really excited for that because I think even the opportunity to meet with clubs and, and you know, speak with them directly about any issues they may have or anything like that. I think that's going to be really important. Um, so I'm really excited for that as well. But um, a, a huge thing for me as well, I got asked to speak on a webinar about gender equality for the ITF. So oh, ITF wow. um, and Advantage All, it's called Advantage All, it's a gender equality initiative. Brilliant. Um, but they would have picked, um, they would have picked four different nations to, to speak about it and kind of talk through what they've been doing in, in their own countries. And, it was a huge honour that I got asked and, and, you know, I was representing Tennis Ireland and, and kind of talking through that. So I think just the more conversation we can have uh, and the more chats we can have, I think that's so important. And I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm advocating for women, but I think men are just as important, um, you know, because as of, as of right now, a huge amount of rent, men have the highest positions in sport. So, you know, unless they're listening, and unless they're saying, okay, what can we do, you know, nothing nothing unfortunately nothing changes you know so uh, i think we're i think we have some fantastic kind of advocates and, and you know male champions in in tennis you know the likes we have fantastic coaches and, and administrators and clubs across the country um who who really do actually put gender equality at the forefront and they're yeah, yeah. 
they're trying to make it a priority and I think that's so important so um, I would just really encourage any club if they can to really sit down and think about it on the committee and and say okay what can we do and I think hopefully the charter will allow them to to start that discussion and have a bigger think about it. Yeah no I think it's brilliant all the no, it definitely seems like you know you you've you're doing doing and have done a you know some really brilliant a brilliant job and had some some great stuff going on like the webinars um, especially and especially having you know the survey and, and then you know bringing it to club level as you're saying I think is a, a big step as well so I guess just I just want to wish you well on that and and ho- hope so hope it all yeah I mean I hope you have some you know, some real tangible success and meet those goals big time. Uh, absolutely I hope so too I think just um it's great that i can now go out and meet clubs yes, <laughs> i yeah. was d- doing a lot of doing a lot of zooms and phone calls um with, with some of the the tennis community so it'll be nice to actually meet people face to face um because i i certainly much prefer that than the, Absolutely, yeah. the phone calls so yeah. thank you very much yeah no all the best with that and then just to, to touch on um for a few couple of minutes uh the in- i know you played the interpros last year which we you know coming coming back to um to your time on, on a team in, in college that, that might have you know, might be the closest thing you'd find maybe over over here. So, how was that experience to, to play for Leinster to play the Interpros? I yeah, I love Interpros. Um, I I just think I any <laughs> I complain about I complain about league, but I sign up every year, so I obviously do enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think Interpros is fantastic. I always think it's such a privilege to play for your province. Um, but I also just think you know the team aspect of it is really really fun, but there also is really competitive matches. I think the standard has improved so much. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, you know, even last year, I'm thinking back to, to Monkstown, like there was such a great buzz around the club. Um, there was really close ties, close matches, you know, came down to maybe the last doubles or, or, or something like that. So I, I am such an advocate for it. Like, I think it's, it's brilliant. And I think potentially if it, if it can be an expanded, that's even better. Um, you know, I think there is room for progress. Like, I think the feedback is always so positive with teams when they play it. And, ju- you yeah. know, just having yeah. that many good players in, in one area is always a, a bonus. And it's a good, it's great crack as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, it's just great fun. And I think, um, yeah, just the whole team aspect is it's no brainer. Like we need more of those kind of team, team tournaments. So the whole idea of representing your province is just kind of an added bonus. Um, but I think if it were to be expanded, there does need to be that buy-in from players. You know, sometimes some of the interpros in years past, you might be asking certain players and they're not around. So I think if it were to expand to maybe, you know, a biannual or a quarterly kind of, you know, they run quarterly events, there needs to be the, the buy-in from players. And potentially that could be tricky if, you know, you have some of your top players going to the States or you know, maybe to England and they're not around. Um, but I think it is a great opportunity to represent your province and maybe it's a matter of not just looking at kind of juniors, vets, seniors, yeah. maybe it's an idea of looking at certain class levels and saying, okay, could we hold, uh, you know, class three, four or level three, four into pros. And, you know, you're giving them the opportunity to to put on the Leinster tracksuit or the Munster tracksuit or wherever it may be. And, you know, maybe they, they don't have that opportunity, so it'd be great to to offer that up to them. So um, I would be really excited if it, if it does progress any further. But I'm I always I love playing into pros. I think it's just it's a great it's a great event, and there's just such a great buzz as well. So yeah, and I mean I, I was I was there last summer in in Monkstown, and I got to you know to, to to be there over the couple of days and and see it, and it was it was brilliant. Just you know all the yeah. as you said, very high quality. But you know, as well, just the atmosphere of of everyone there, and especially um when when, when um Julie Byrne was playing, you know, obviously in her, in her home club and having the support, yes. and you know, just it, it did feel like a really big thing almost in Irish tennis, you know, having those top players all playing, and yeah. I think it is something that that can be used, you know, with within Irish tennis to you know, to almost promote it, and and you can really see what those top players are like up close and personal. Absolutely. I think it almost like flies under the radar sometimes. Yeah. And it's only unless you actually are walking past or, you know, make it make it be known that you're going to head down there and, and watch and support. Um, you, you just don't even know it. it's how great it is. Uh, but um, no, I think we'll um, just a couple more questions for you, Gwani. It's been, been really to talk yeah. to you and I really, really appreciate the time. Um, I just want to finish off no, with a, a bit of a quick fire round, just some, some quick questions, quick answers. Um, All right. That's I'm okay. Ready. 
Uh, so first one, favourite shot in tennis? Uh, when timed correctly, uh, my forehand drive volley. When timed yeah. not correctly, not my forehand <laughs> no. drive volley. Uh, favourite tournament? Uh, it's going to be a cliche response, but Wimbledon. I love yeah. Wimbledon. Uh, favourite player? Uh, Del Potro. I oh, yeah. wish I could just hit a forehand like him once just to feel, <laughs> <laughs> just see what it felt yeah. like. Definitely yeah. Del Potro. Uh, favourite surface? Favourite surface? Probably, ooh, I like practicing on clay, um, but probably playing on like a hard court or like a yeah. slow hard court. Uh, short juice or long juice? Um, short juice all the way. Just, yeah. just quick, quick, see what happens. Short yeah. juice all the way. <laughs> one, one real change you'd make in tennis, so would that be it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd much rather the short juice. Um, or well, when when it goes well, or when it goes, in, in, you know, in favor of myself. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I probably would put it more into like tournaments, just to, in the early rounds, and maybe if you're getting into final, then you play the long, the mm. the normal format. But yeah, I like short juice. That would be yeah. a real change. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, your your advice for for juniors? Oof. Um. Probably just to. I think I used to get really bogged down in things that were out of my hand. So maybe just advice saying control what you can control. So, yeah. you know, if you're putting in the right preparation, if you're, you know, eating the right foods, if you're getting enough sleep, if you're playing the right shots, like don't think about, you know, the weather, the wet astro turf, the balls, yeah. <laughs> how good your opponent is playing. You know, if someone calls a few bad calls, like you can only control what you can control. So, um, that would be my advice. Just I think that, not that's get brilliant. Too yeah. Brilliant advice. Um, and finally, what's your, your favorite thing about tennis? Oh, <laughs> uh, I feel like I should say the competition, but I think the social aspect. Yeah. Um, I've I've been really lucky. Like the majority of the friendships I've made have been through tennis. So I think just playing a sport you like, but also being surrounded by really nice friends. <laughs> that sounds really corny, but <laughs> I think yeah, the social aspect and the friendships. Probably. Yeah, brilliant. That's it. So well done. You made it through. Um, yeah. So thank, 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 yeah, thanks, thank, thanks very much for for chatting. And it's brilliant to to get your thoughts. And um, obviously, just big well done on all the the work with, with tennis Ireland for for the women in tennis. And and best of luck as as you move that forward and and keep and keep going with it. Thanks, Adam. Same to you with the podcast and and um, the Twitter page. I you you keep me informed. So thanks very much. And you kept me entertained during lockdown. I was listening to all the podcasts. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks very much. <laughs> a big thank you once again to Gronia O'Neill for her time to talk to me. And just want to wish her all the best again with, uh, with her role in, in Tennis Ireland going forward. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Irish Tennis Updates podcast. If you did enjoy it or you did find it useful or interesting, please do consider subscribing, liking, sharing the podcast with with anybody that you think might also find it useful or interesting a big thank you in advance for that and until next week please join me again next week and until then i've been adam your host and goodbye